Hello, my name is Jared Niemi, and I am talking in this lecture about Bayesian parameter estimation. You may be interested in going back and viewing the previous lecture about Bayesian approaches to common inferential questions in statistics. Just as a reminder, Bayesian parameter estimation is all based off of the posterior distribution for the parameter, that is the distribution for the parameter conditional on the observed data, and this is equal to the model or the likelihood times the prior divided by the marginal likelihood or prior predictive distribution. It is common practice to write this posterior distribution as being proportional to the terms that involve the parameter theta, that is the terms that are to the left of this conditioning bar. In this case that includes the model as well as the prior. It turns out that writing it in this format uh, eases much of the mathematics involved in deriving these posterior distributions. Alright, so I'm going to start with a motivating example. I uh, went to Duke for my graduate education and have become a Duke basketball fan. So I'm going to bring an example from that area. In particular, uh, there's a player who's a senior this year. His name is Mason Plumley, and the commentators, as you watch at Duke basketball, constantly comment on how improved his free throw success probability is this season. So in this particular mini lecture, I'm just going to go through the process of understanding how we can possibly estimate his free throw success probability. The data, as of the 14th of January, which is today, um, he has made 79 of the 120 free throws that he's attempted. And so one of the questions is, all right, so given this data, what is his free throw success probability? A common model for these situations would be the binomial model. Here we assume, or we denote, y is the number of free throws that he made, n is the number of free throws that were attempted, and theta is the success probability between those free throws. I've written IID here, that was from a previous uh, version of the slide. These are, this is, of course, there's no extra random variables, so y is just binomially distributed with n and theta here is known. Alright, so writing this model down defines the probability mass function for the data that we're going to observe. In the notation on the previous slide, the previous two, two slides ago, this is p of y given theta. And here we just uh, write down the binomial probability mass function. n choose y, theta to the y, 1 minus theta to the n minus y. Alright, so what we're going to assume for the purpose of this mini lecture is that the parameter theta, which is the unknown free throw success probability, we're going to assume has a beta distribution, a priori, with parameters alpha and beta. Right, that is, before we observe any data, we believe that this parameter has a beta distribution with some hyperparameters alpha and beta. And what's written down here is the probability density function for this parameter with that assumption, that beta distribution assumption right here. Alright, so uh, once we've defined the model up here and the prior here, we have everything that we need to to derive the posterior. And here I'm going to show the easy way to do it. This easy way is going to incorporate that proportionality sign that I mentioned on the second slide. Um, I'll also link to an, uh, the same example doing it the hard way, where you actually have to find the prior predictor distribution, multiply likelihood times prior, divide by that prior predictor distribution to derive at the posterior. But here's the easy way. All right. So the first thing to do is just to write down that the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. And remember that this proportionality constant is incorporating everything that does not have a theta in it. So when we write down the actual um, equation for the likelihood and for the prior, we can remove all the terms that do not include a theta. In particular, from the binomial model, we've removed the term of n choose y. And from the beta distribution, we've removed the term of 1 over that beta function. 
right? That all just gets wrapped up into this proportionality constant, and the only things that are left are the terms that have a theta. The next step here is to combine the like terms. That means to combine the theta to the y and theta to the alpha minus 1, as well as combining the 1 minus theta to the n minus y with the 1 minus theta to the beta minus 1. So we've done that. Uh, and I'm trying to be explicit here, but when there's an exact equality and when it's only proportional, we have not dropped any more terms that incorporate, that do not include theta, so here we have an equal sign. And so we have now a theta to the alpha plus y minus 1, and a 1 minus theta to the beta plus n minus y minus 1. And the key at this point is to recognize that this is the so-called kernel of the beta distribution. Right? Theta to something, 1 minus theta to something, looks a lot like a beta distribution. And that distribution turns out to be the beta distribution with hyperparameters alpha plus y and beta plus n minus y. Now the key here is that the posterior distribution is going to be a valid, a proper posterior distribution, at least in this case. And so since we know that, all we need to see is the kernel of the distribution, that is the terms that involve the random variable that we're interested in, in this case, theta. Once we see that kernel, we can immediately discover what distribution the posterior should be. All right, so we'll notice that our the posterior here is a beta distribution with the hyperparameter, and the hyperparameters have been updated. Right, so in the prior, the hyperparameters were just alpha and beta. Now it's alpha plus y and beta plus n minus y. And when the posterior is in the same distribution family as the prior, we say that the prior is conjugate in this model. So more specifically for this particular model, we would say that the beta prior is conjugate for the binomial model with unknown success probability. Just to reiterate, Conjugacy is a property of a prior and a model where the prior has the same family as the posterior. The advantage of a conjugate model is that they, they it's analytically tractable. Right? There's no computation that's necessary. Later we'll see situations where you have non-conjugate models and then you need to do some type of computation. Alright, so now that we've derived this posterior, we would typically be interested in things like point estimates and interval estimates. All right, so there's at least three common point estimates. Um, the three that I'll mention here are the mean, median, and the mode. And so we can, the posterior expectation, expectation, the mean, we have is just the first parameter divided by the sum of the two parameters. Um, that is a typo and will be fixed. Uh, the second part here is true. So it's alpha plus y over alpha plus beta plus n. So again, this negative sign right here should be a plus, and that will be changed in the next version of the slides. Um, we could have also used the mode. In this case, the mode just takes the numerator and subtracts 1, and the denominator and subtracts 2. Uh, or we could use the median. In this case, the median is only approximate. Um, but it lies somewhere between the mean and the mode. All right, so there are three point estimates. Uh, the most common one, as mentioned, would be the mean. If we are interested in interval estimates, um, we, from the posterior, we can create any type of interval estimate that we would want. We can create one-tailed or two-tailed. We can create interval estimates that have any percentage that we want. So, for example, we might be interested in an equal tail 100, 1 minus gamma percent credible interval. So these interval estimates that we're going to describe here are called credible intervals. And I'll talk about the interpretation at the end of this slide, and that's the reason for distinguishing them from other types of interval estimates. All right, so this interval estimate is going to be AB such that the integral from negative infinity up to a of the posterior distribution is half of the error rate in this interval. 
the upper tail is going to be the other half. So this is the that this error rate from b up to infinity is going to be half of the error rate. So the reason it's an equal tail is because each of them have the same um, probability. Above a, sorry, below a and above b. So in particular for this beta posterior, we can write in the posterior distribution for our success probability and we have these formulas. Uh, but typically, instead of evaluating these formulas by hand, we're going to use a statistical software to find uh, the endpoints for us. So, for example, we can use R and use the Q beta function to find our two endpoints. Now, we're calling this a credible interval, and that's because our interpretation is different from, for example, confidence intervals. The interpretation here is that the probability, the parameters in the interval a, b, is the percentage that we wanted. Now, just to, to clarify, this is actually conditional on our model and conditional on the prior that we used and on the data that we observed. Right, given those conditioning statements, the probability that the parameter is in that interval is the desired percentile. All right, so let's return to our example of Mason Plumlee's free throw percent. Um, in these situations, uh, whenever you're dealing with a probability, a very common non-informative prior is the beta 1 1 prior. This is, the u this is equivalent to the uniform prior from 0 to 1. Uh, this, in reality, for free throw percentages in basketball, is probably not the most... Um, well, we could come up with informative priors that seem more reasonable. Because this prior says that he has the same probability of having a free throw percent less than 10% as he would of having one above 90% as he would of having a free throw percentage success probability between 50 and 60. Um, and that's not generally true with, with basketball players. Typically there are more players that have a free throw percentage around 50 to 60 than they do very close to 0 or very close to 100. Nonetheless, we'll use this non-informative prior. We can combine this with Plumlee's free throw data and find that the posterior is a beta distribution with now parameters 80 and whatever that number is. So what is that? 20, uh, 42. Alright, so now that we have the posterior, one thing we could do is we could actually just plot the posterior itself. So here is, for example, the free throw success probability posterior for Plumlee's data for 2012-2013 season up to the 14th of January. We could also create or calculate the mean median mode, these point estimates, they're all approximately 66%. In addition, we could calculate and a credible interval, for example, a 95% equal tail credible interval, which is 57 to 74%. So that's saying that if we think that Plumlee has a common free throw percent for the whole year, um, and given the data that we have and our prior of a beta 1 1, that the probability, there's 95% probability that his free throw success is between 57% and 74%. I hope you've enjoyed this mini lecture on Bayesian parameter estimation using the beta binomial model as an example. Thank you.